Hello, hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about the chi-square and the Fisher's exact test and what we need to think about when we run them. As I always say, it is easy to do stats to produce a p-value, especially with prism, but it is not so easy to do good stats. So let's do it right. In a nutshell, we use a chi-square or Fisher's exact test when we want to know if there is a significant difference between two proportions. The chi-square can actually compare more than two, but we will not talk about it in this video. Now, if we want to do a good job, there are a few questions we need to answer to. First, what is a qualitative variable on which the tests are applied? Then there are two tests, so there must be a difference between the two. We may also wonder how the test works, as it would be silly to use a test if we do not know how it works. Finally, what does it mean significant? Is there more to it than a p-value? Okay, let's get on with it. First of all, what is a qualitative variable? Well, it is about quality and not quantity, so the values are not numerical. Qualitative data are also referred to as categorical data, and they come in three flavors. Nominal, in which case they take a name, like a genotype or a species, for instance. Ordinal, when the values have an intrinsic order, like three levels of happiness. And binary, when values come from two categories, like alive or dead, for instance. Okay, next. What's the difference between the tests? Well, for a start, the chi-square is dead easy to calculate by hand, but the Fisher's very hard, which is why many software, including Prism, will not run a Fisher's exact test on contingency tables bigger than 2 by 2 because it is too heavy computationally. Second, the Fisher's exact test was specifically designed for small samples and it will be more accurate then than the chi-square. It will give an exact p-value, hence the name, whereas the chi-square will only give an approximation. Conversely, the chi-square is more accurate than the Fisher's exact test on large samples. Now, it is because of the complexity of the Fisher's formula that I am going to concentrate on the chi-square one. But really, we can think of the two tests as working in a similar fashion, or rather, we can interpret the outcome in a similar way. So, how does the chi-square work? Well, the main thing is that it is going to compare observed frequencies with expected ones. The observed frequencies are the one, well, we observe in our experiment, duh, and the expected ones are the ones we would have expected to see if there had been no relationship whatsoever between the two variables. Now, like most statistical tests, the chi-square produces a statistic chi-square, which, like most statistics, is about a difference of some kind. As we can see here at the numerator, we have the difference between the observed and expected. So the bigger that difference, the more likely it is that what we observe is not due to chance. Okay, so enough theory, let's do it. We are going to look at line dancing cats and why not. Right, so let's look at an experiment where cats were trained to line dance with two different rewards, food or affection. The pivotal question here is, is there a relationship between the rewards and the proportion of cats line dancing? You notice that I only talk about relationship here and not causality. A stats test is never about causality, but only about relationship between variables and factors. It is our interpretation which introduces causality. Anyway, these guys used 68 cats, that's a lot of cats, and the results are presented in the contingency table here, and on the graph on the right. Remember, a good graphical representation says most of the story, so here, looking at this graph, we are expecting some significance. So, we are pretty clear on how to get the observed frequencies, but what about the expected ones? I am sure you are dying to know, so let me show you. Let's look, for example, at the expected frequency of cats line dancing after having received food as a reward. There are two ways to figure it out, the so-called direct counts approach, which is a direct application of the chi-square formula and the official way to think about it, and a bit of a more intuitive way referred to as the probability approach, which applies the multiplicative rule. Depending on how your brain works, you may prefer one or the other, so I present both. Okay. So first, the direct counts approach. In that case, the expected frequency equals row total multiplied by column total divided by grand total. So 
for our example, it is 32 times 32 divided by 68, which is 15.1. That's the number of cats we would have expected to line dance after having received food as a reward if there had been no relationship whatsoever between reward and likelihood of line dancing. Now, if it does not make too much sense to you, let's try the probability approach. So, the multiplicative rule, which you may remember, states that the probability of a joint occurrence of two or more independent events is the product of the individual probabilities. So, in that experiment, regardless of the rewards, the probability of a cat line dancing is 32 divided by 68. Similarly, regardless of the outcome, the probability of a cat receiving food as a reward is also 32 divided by 68. So, the probability of these two independent events, which is what the expected frequencies is about, right, to occur at the same time is simply the multiplication of the two probabilities, which gives us 0 0.22, and 22% of 68 is 15.1, voila. And of course, this is done for all four groups. Now, we can see that the expected values are much more similar to one another than the observed one. And it makes sense since it is supposed to be pretty random. And they would be even more similar if the design was perfectly balanced, which it is not. We have a bit more cats in one group than in the other. Now that we have, one way or the other, the observed and expected frequencies, let's apply the chi-square formula. Okay, so on the left, the observed frequencies, and on the right, the expected ones. The next step is just algebra. With the values we have, the chi-square formula gives us 28.4. Now the question is, is 28.4 big enough for the test to be significant? We could, just for fun, do it the old-fashioned way. We could compare our chi-square value to the critical one from the chi-square table. We would select 0 0.05 as the significance level and one degree of freedom as we are looking at a 2x2 two two table. And in our case, we can see that the chi-square value is way above the critical value, so yay, that's significant. By the way, I explain more about the critical value and degrees of freedom in the videos on power analysis and descriptive stats. Now, luckily, we do not have to do it by hand, nor do we have to look at dusty stats table because we have PRISM. As always, doing stats with PRISM is intuitive and pretty straightforward, once we have chosen the correct table format, which in our case is contingency table, of course. Next, we just have to go for the default statistical approach. Now, by default, PRISM will have chosen the Fisher's test for us because we have a 2x2 two two table. If we had a bigger one, it would have chosen the chi-square approach. The Yates correction is supposed to improve the p-value given by the test, which is an approximation, but it overdoes it, meaning that the p-value gets too big. On top of it, not everyone agrees on it, so it's probably best to ignore it altogether. We can also calculate effect sizes, such as the odds ratios, which is pretty cool. It is literally the ratio of the odds, the odds of dancing in one group over the odds of dancing in the other one. And here are the results. On the left, we have the Fisher's exact test, and on the right, the chi-square we did together. So we reached the same conclusion, which is that there is a significant association between type of reward and likelihood of dancing. And we can quantify the strength of the association with the odds ratio. So here we can say that if you are a dancing cat, you are almost 22 times more likely to have received food as a reward than affection. Now, in data analysis, there is more than just significance, and here there are three super important things to keep in mind. In the context of qualitative data, if they can be presented as percentages, like in the graph on the right, the test should always, always be run on actual counts. If we use percentages, we make our sample size artificially 100, which can overestimate the real sample, like in here, or underestimate it. Remember that significance is not only about effect size, it is also about sample size. So we need to use the actual counts to get a p-value we can trust, as in consistent with the confidence we have in our data, which has a lot to do with the size of the sample. A p-value should always be interpreted in the context of the experiment, and in particular, the power associated with it. If you are shaky on that concept, check out the video on power calculation. Thank you for listening, and don't forget, stats don't have to be scary.